verse on the screen. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord is holy. Always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is within you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. I'm in a series of messages entitled Defending the Faith. We began two weeks ago talking about how, you know, it's probably best if we try to defend the faith with a lifestyle that matches what we believe. How important it is to be living the life that would match up with what the Bible tells us to do. In fact, it's summed up in those words there in that verse of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, to honor Christ the Lord as holy. But then last week we shifted a little bit, and this morning we will be the same. More teach than preach. Last week we talked about how we got our Bible. How the 66 books that are in your Bible came together to be known as your Bible. A person on the way out of the door last Sunday morning said, I feel like I've been in a seminary class. And you probably will feel the same way again today. I want to do more teach than preach. It's different than what I normally do. It's not what we normally would do on Sunday morning at the sermon time. Usually it's a message, but, but I need to teach you some things. Because you see, one of these days, if not already, you're going to send a son or a grandson, a daughter or a granddaughter off to college, or they're going to get out there in the world, and somebody's going to say to them, well, what do you mean you believe the Bible? Don't you know that's full of errors? Don't you know the Bible's full of contradictions? Don't you know the Bible has all kinds of things in it that are wrong? And they're going to want to know what to say to that person. They're, go, they're going to want to know how to answer back to that person who ridicules or mocks or simply refuses to even consider their faith in Christ. Because, you know, after all, the Bible is just full of contradictions and errors. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Does the Bible contain errors? And so you're going to need to turn to a lot of different scriptures today, but we're going to start in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 31, and I promise you that I eventually am going to get there. I promise you that I eventually will find my way to Matthew chapter 31 and verse 13. If you didn't bring a Bible with you today, there's a Bible in the pew rack there in front of you, and if you'll find page 819, page 819 in the pew Bible, there you will find Matthew chapter 13 verse 31. And again, we're not going to expound that text. I'm just going to use it as an example of, a, of, of something in just a moment. Matthew 31, 13 will be, a, excuse me, Matthew 13, 31. I don't want to confuse you. Matthew 13, 31. And we will uh, we'll use that as an example of something. Let's pray. Would you ask God just to speak through me today? so I can be clear and not boring and that you would would you pray for yourself that that you could hear what you need to hear that the Lord would speak to you where you are this morning let's let's pray Father I thank you today for the opportunity to teach your word I pray that you would speak through me and to each of us here today these truths. And I pray, Father, that people who hear today would understand. Thank you, Father, for the opportunity to do this. I pray, Father, that, that souls will be won into the kingdom because one day, somewhere, somebody here will be ready to make a defense, will give an answer for the reason, for the hope that is within them based on what they hear today. And so, Father, I pray that in Christ's name. Amen. I have a friend who lives out in California. He grew up in the same town that I did. In fact, lived in my neighborhood. He's an atheist. We communicate regularly through Facebook. He says things to me like, 
How can you trust the Bible? You cannot trust the Bible, Pepper. It is full of errors. It is full of contradictions. It's full of falsehoods. And besides, we don't even have any of the original manuscripts. All we have is copies. How do we really know what John wrote? How do we really know what Matthew wrote? We don't have their originals. We really have no idea what they actually wrote, do we? How would you answer him? Well, I would say don't make so many judgments till you actually know what you're talking about. I heard this week about a conversation between two people who were discussing whether or not cheerleading was an actual sport. One said no, the other said yes. One said you don't throw anything or catch anything. The other one said except humans. You try it. So the one did and realized cheerleading is tough. Cheerleading is tiring. And they came away saying, okay, now I believe cheerleading is a sport. So I, I want you to know what you're talking about. I want you to have tried out all the statements the skeptics make about the Bible and have an answer. We'll deal primarily this morning with the New Testament. Mainly because that's what all the critics want to talk about. Hardly anybody is arguing the veracity of the Old Testament as far as what the manuscripts say. Because you see, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in 1947, manuscripts of the Old Testament were found that date from 250 B.C. to about 50 A.D. Prior to that, the oldest Old Testament manuscript we had dated from 900 A.D. So when the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, they pushed the Hebrew manuscript evidence back 1,000 years. We got 1,000 years earlier to the original manuscripts, documents of the Old Testament. And the Dead Sea Scrolls simply confirmed that the Hebrew books of the Bible, your Old Testament, were meticulously and faithfully copied. In other words, they are accurate and they are trustworthy. Nobody is arguing the veracity of the Old Testament as far as what the manuscripts say. So let's talk about the New Testament. No. We do not have any of the original manuscripts. In other words, we don't have Matthew's copy. We don't have John's copy. We don't have Paul's letter to the Romans or the Corinthians. Think about why we possibly don't. I mean, from a spiritual point of view. Can you imagine if, if we did have those manuscripts that God in His sovereignty has seen fit not to preserve? They would be worshipped, not studied. That's just, that's my opinion. We'd have them under a glass case somewhere and there'd be people lined up all the time to go look at them. They would be worshipped and not studied and God doesn't want anything or anyone worshipped before Him. So, what we have is copies. Do you know how many original manuscripts of Homer's Iliad we have? None. None whatsoever. Do you know how many original manuscripts of Aristotle's writings we have? Do you know how many original manuscripts of Plato's writings we have? Zero. Zip. Nada. And nobody goes around saying, man, we have no idea what Plato wrote because we don't have the original manuscripts. We, we don't have any idea what Aristotle wrote because we don't have any of his original writings. Nobody says that. What we have of Homer and Plato and Aristotle is copies. That's why they don't say, we don't know what they wrote. Because we have copies. Homer's Iliad, we have 643 copies, manuscript copies of Homer, Homer's Iliad. The earliest copy we have is written 500 years after Homer wrote it. 
Plato's writings, Plato's Republic. We have eight copies of Plato's Republic written 1,200 years after Plato wrote it. Aristotle. We have five copies of Aristotle's writings. Written, the earliest, written 1,400 years after Aristotle wrote it. Your New Testament? We have 25,000 copies of your New Testament. The earliest is 50 years. 50. Not 500, not 1,200, not 1,400. The earliest is 50 years after the last book, Revelation, in your New Testament was written. 25,000 copies of the New Testament. That's 5,000 if you're taking notes. That's 5,700 copies in Greek. That's 10,000 copies in Latin. And that is 10,000 plus copies written in other languages, Coptic, Syriac, Armenian, to name just a few. 25,000 copies of the New Testament. And 97% of those documents are exactly alike. They're identical. They are word for word, page for page, 25,000 of them, and 97% of those manuscript copies are identical, exactly alike. Let me tell you why. Because it was a meticulous process to copy in the first century. It wasn't like today where it's all digital, obviously, where you could just Xerox a copy of it. No, no, you had to hand copy everything. Let me tell you what a scribe did when he sat down, and we're just going to pretend he's sitting down here with a copy of Matthew's Gospel, and he's going to make another copy of it. The first thing he does is he would, is he would wash himself completely. He would clean his body. He'd take a bath. And then he would put on a clean white robe because he was fixing to do something. He was about to do something so holy and so sacred that he just didn't want to rush into it or enter into it even with a speck of dirt on his body. So he would clean himself. Then he would pray. And then he would begin to copy. And he would take his paper, take his scroll, and he would copy from the one he was looking at. And when the document that he was looking at reached the bottom of the page, he stopped. In in other words, in other words, he didn't write continually on the same page if the scroll he was looking at had another page. And so the pages all match up. There's not like, okay, here's a page and a half, but over here it's just a page. No, no. When he got to the end of the page of the one he was looking at, he would stop the one he was copying. And then he would go back and he would count the words on the page he had just written and he would count the words on the page he had just copied and make sure he had all of the same number of words. Then he would count the letters in the words he had just written and then he would count the letters in the copy that he had to make sure that the letters that he had written and the letters that he were copying were exactly the same. Then he would do that same thing again backwards. He would start at the bottom of the page and count the letters this time backwards all the way up to the top of the page to make sure that every letter that he had, the same number of letters on the copy he had just made was on the copy that he was making it from. How many of you want to spend your day being a scribe? But that's the meticulous nature of copying that took place. 25,000 manuscript copies of the New Testament, 97% of them are exactly identical alike. So here's our life point today. Holy words long preserved for our walk in this world They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Would you just remember those last two lines that I have underlined up there for you? Ancient words ever true. 
changing me, changing you. But still, 97% of 25,000 manuscripts is only 24,250. So that leaves us with approximately 750 copies of the New Testament that contain variances. So before I go on, let me explain the difference between errors and variances. Those who claim the Bible has errors, really they're alleged errors. All, all the manuscripts say the same thing, but they just think what the manuscripts say is wrong. Matthew 13, 31 is an example of that. Matthew chapter 13, 31. Here's one of the things the critics point to that will tell you the Bible contains errors. Matthew 13, 31, he put another parable before them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a grain of mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It is the smallest of all the seeds, but when it is grown, it becomes larger than all the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and make nests in its branches. Did you know that the mustard seed is not the smallest of all the seeds? Well, Jesus said it was right there. He said it right there. No, it's not. It wasn't even the smallest of all the seeds in Jesus' day. But again, Jesus is speaking, referencing the mustard seed in a proverbial sense. Using an example familiar to his audience of a seed that is known for its small. Doesn't change the plan of salvation one bit. Another alleged error is Matthew chapter 16. Just turn over a few pages. Matthew chapter 16, verse 16. Here's what the critics say. Matthew chapter 16, verse 16 says, Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Mark's account in 8... 29, Mark chapter 8, verse 29, simply says, Peter replied, you are the Christ. Luke says in chapter 9, verse 20, you are the Christ of God. And the critics say, well, which is it? What did he say? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God, or you are the Christ, or you are the Christ of God. The responses are not identical in the three Gospels. But they're not contradictory. Mark and Luke are recording a partial version of the fuller response that Matthew records. That is all. Matthew's account of the resurrection tells us that there was one angel sitting there who had rolled away the tomb. Luke's account of the resurrection tells us there were two angels sitting there after the stone had been rolled away. Well, who's right? See, the Bible contradicts itself. Matthew tells us there's one angel. Luke tells us there's two. Matthew focuses on the one that speaks. As an angel speaking. So, that's about all the critics have when it comes to errors. We got Jesus saying that the mustard seed is the smallest seed known to man when it's really not. We got... We got Peter saying, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And yet Mark said, he only said, you are the Christ. And Luke said, you, you are the Christ of God. It's not identical. And then Matthew says, at the resurrection, there was one angel. And Luke says, there's two. Let me tell you what variances are. Let me talk about variances. Remember, 97% of the manuscripts are identical. That leaves 3% that have differences. In other words, here's a copy of Matthew's Gospel, and here's another copy of Matthew's Gospel, and there's a difference in what one of the verses says. There's a difference. They're not exactly identically the same. Of the 3% of the manuscripts, excuse me, yeah, of the 3% of the manuscripts that are not exactly the same, and you see the differences, 95% of the differences are spelling differences. Let me give you an example. 
As the scribes went back and forth, and even though they meticulously would count letters and number of words on the page and all that, as the scribes went back and forth from the copy that they were using to the copy they were making, they would miss a letter every once in a while. They would skip a letter every once in a while. They would, or they might add a letter every once in a while. For example, every time you see John's name in the New Testament, it is either spelled with one N or it is spelled with two N's. But every time there's a difference, that has to be recorded as a variant in the text. Because it's different in this manuscript. John only has one N in this manuscript. Oh, and wait, John has two N's in this manuscript. So every time John appears in this gospel, his name does, and it's spelled with one N. And every time John's name appears in this gospel and it's spelled with two N's, every one of those is a separate variant and it has to be recorded that way it has zero impact on the translation or the meaning of the text obviously let me give you another example you know English we use the we use the word a or we use the word an according to what we're going to say next we say a book we say an apple if the word we're going to say next starts with a vowel, we put the little word, little letter in on the in, on the beginning. Excuse me, on the end of the word, and we say an apple. We don't say a apple. We say an apple, or we say a book, because that book does not begin with a vowel. Well, Greek is just the same way, and some manuscripts in the Greek have an in where it shouldn't be, and sometimes they don't have it where it should be. But so every time. That the end is where it shouldn't be or not where it should be, that has to be recorded as a textual variant. And those two differences are by far the most common difference in all of the New Testament. 95% of the differences in the text of the New Testament are spelling errors, and those little grammar errors. So when atheist Bart Ehrman says there are thousands of variants in the New Testament manuscripts, he's right. But what he's talking about is just what I described to you. Sometimes John has one N, sometimes it has two. Sometimes the word A should have an N on it, and sometimes it shouldn't, and so... A variant has to be recorded. Again, it has no impact whatsoever on the meaning or the translation of the text. Ancient words, ever true, changing me, changing you. Now, there are some differences and variances in the text that are minor, which don't affect the meaning. John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. Don't take time to turn, just listen. John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3 is an example of that. Some say Jesus, some say Lord. So when the copyist came across John chapter 4, verses 1, 2, and 3, it mentions Jesus and he and, and there. And sometimes if the copy I'm using says Jesus and the copy I'm making, the copyist or the scribe would write the word Lord instead of Jesus. In Matthew and Luke, some of the manuscripts put the proper pronoun in front of the word Mary. Some of the manuscripts of Matthew and Luke refer to her as the Mary, and they refer to John as, excuse me, Joseph as the Joseph. So you have some manuscripts in Matthew, and you have some manuscripts of Luke that talk about the Mary and the Joseph, where other manuscripts you simply have referred to them as Mary and Joseph. But they have to be recorded as variants in the New Testament. Now, there are minor differences that do affect the meaning. And I've got four of them for you, and I've put them on the, put them on the screen for you so you can follow me if you want to. There are some minor differences that do affect the meaning. Mark chapter 9, verse 29 is the first one. And here's what it says. Mark chapter 9, verse 29 says, And Jesus, or and he said to them, This kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Here Jesus has cast out a certain kind of demon, and he says it can't be done except by prayer. 
And some manuscripts add, and fasting. That's it. Some manuscripts add on, in Mark 9.29, this kind cannot be driven out except by prayer and fasting. Now, it does affect the practice of it. I mean, if you're interested in driving out demons, you might want to know that it's not just prayer, but sometimes it is fasting. Some of the manuscripts have just prayer. Some of them have and fasting. Does my salvation depend on that? No. Romans 5, 1 is another example. Romans 5, 1... Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Some of the manuscripts say, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, let us have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The difference is one letter in the Greek between we have peace with God and let us have peace with God. One letter in the Greek changes the whole meaning of that sentence. And there are some manuscripts that have, we have peace with God, and there are some manuscripts of Romans that say, let us have peace with God. Scholars are actually split on which Paul wrote, but the point is, neither variant is a contradiction of any other teaching of Scripture. The next one is similar to that. It's in 1 John chapter 1 in verse 4. 1 John chapter 1 and verse 4 says, And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. Some manuscripts say we are writing these things so your joy may be complete. So every manuscript in the New Testament that has the word your joy and every manuscript in the New Testament that has the word our joy has to be counted as a variant because it's not identically the same in all 25,000 manuscripts. So that our joy may be complete. That would mean John is referring to himself. I'm writing these things so that my joy can be made complete. Or I'm writing these things so that your joy can be made complete. The meaning is different. Absolutely it is. And again, the scholars are split as to exactly which one John wrote. Early manuscripts, again, have it both ways. So the meaning is affected, but again, no foundational belief whatsoever is in jeopardy, zero. And either way, the obvious meaning of what John wrote is, this letter is going to bring joy. Now here's my favorite, Revelation 13, 18. Here's my favorite, Revelation 13, 18. Now this will keep you up at night, okay? This will keep you up at night. Revelation 13, 18. You know this verse. When you get there, you will. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666. Six, six. Did you know the earliest manuscripts of Revelation say 616? Now that changes everything, doesn't it? I mean, that, that just, that changed. The mark of the beast is not 666, it's 616. According to the earliest manuscripts of Revelation that we have. Any of that change the plan of salvation? Not one bit. Not one bit. Holy words, long preserved, for our walk in this world... They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart. Ancient words ever true, changing me, changing you. Now put your boots on, okay? Put your boots on because there are two differences in the manuscripts that are significant. John chapter 7, verse 53. John chapter 7 and verse 53. They each went to his own house. 
But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, and early in the morning he came again to the temple. And all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery, and placing her in their midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law of Moses, it commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? This they said to test him, that they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. As they continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. What a story. You are amazed at the love of Jesus. We are amazed at the grace and the mercy of Jesus and how he stood up to the Pharisees. I love this story. You you love this story. We're glad that we we, we want it in, in our Bible. But John probably never wrote it. Probably never wrote it. This is a story that has come down to us on one sheet of paper. And the scribes didn't know what to do with it. They didn't know where to put it. And so some of them put it in in John's gospel. And some of them put it in Luke's gospel. Did you know this story is found in some manuscripts in Luke's gospel? And actually... Actually, the vocabulary and the style of it match Luke better than they do John. It's an incident in Jesus' life that is, again, like on a, on a loose-leaf sheet of paper, and the scribes didn't know what to do with it, and so they stuck it into John's Gospel in some manuscripts, and they stuck it into Luke's Gospel in other manuscripts. And you say, well, is, is, is it authentic? Well, let me make a distinction. Is it literarily authentic? In other words, did John actually write this story? Probably not. Is it historically authentic? Did it really happen? Scholars believe it did. Scholars believe it did. So when Bart Ertman reports that the story isn't authentic, the Bible cannot be trusted because of that story of Jesus and the woman caught in the act of adultery. Now you know the rest of the story. The last one is Mark chapter 16. Turn to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16 verse 1. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went out to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, don't be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. And there you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. And that is where the best and the earliest manuscripts of Mark's gospel ends. You say, wait, no it doesn't. Look here, there's 12 more verses there. No, 
earliest and the best manuscripts we have of Mark's gospel end at verse 8. Well, how did those other 12 verses get in there? Two theories. One is that Mark wrote an ending and they have been lost. One is that Mark wrote an ending and that original copy of his ending has somehow not made it. It's, it's been lost. The other theory is is that that is where Mark really ended his gospel. And the scribe who was copying Mark's gospel came to the end of Mark's gospel and said, no, 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 we, we, we don't have a resurrection appearance. It ends with these two women and they're, and they're afraid. And so he wanted to round out, this scribe did, he wanted to round out Mark's gospel, so he wrote an ending to Mark's gospel. The scribe probably do from material in Luke's gospel and Luke's account of the early church in Acts where Paul was bitten by a snake and people speak in tongues. If you'll notice that in verse 17, and these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons and and speak in new tongues and they will pick up serpents with their hands and if they drink any deadly poison it will not hurt them and if they lay their hands on the sick they will recover. All of that takes place in the book of Acts. Verse 19, so when the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and set down at the right hand of God. That's Luke's language out of his gospel and out of the first chapter of of Acts. And so this scribe probably drew his material from Luke's gospel and Luke's account of the early church in Acts. And it's not a part of Mark's gospel. In fact, I had a seminary professor tell me, Prepper, never preach from those verses in the Gospel of Mark. Because they're not Scripture. They're not Scripture. But once they they make it into our Bible, it's hard to get them out. You know what I honestly believe? I honestly believe Mark ended his Gospel with verse 8. The short ending. I, I think where Mark intended to end his Gospel... There's a resurrection, yes. The angel has attested to it, and the tomb is empty. And I believe Mark is essentially saying to his readers, okay, now, what are you going to do with Jesus? We have a resurrection, we have an angel that attests to it. The tomb is empty. What are you going to do with this information? What are you going to do with Jesus. Can I ask you that same question, sir? Can I ask you that same question, ma'am? What are you going to do with Jesus? Here's the bottom line this morning, dear family. Does any of the things I've talked about this morning, about errors and variances in the Bible, does anything I've talked about this morning change any doctrine we believe? No. Is any theological belief affected? No. Is any practice called into question the way we should live or our lifestyle? No. Has the plan of salvation changed one bit? No. God has accurately preserved His truth for us. Holy words, long preserved, for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart, ancient words ever true, changing me, changing you. This God who authored this book wants you to know Him. This God who authored this book wants you to believe in Him. And you must answer the question that I believe Mark intended every reader of his gospel to answer. What are you going to do with Jesus? What now are you going to do with Jesus? Let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your word that's trustworthy, true. And I pray today now, Father, that we... We've got a little bit of an answer 
Maybe a big answer. To someone who says, you know, the Bible just has a lot of contradictions in it. It's got a lot of errors. I mean, there's thousands of differences in the Bible. I pray now, Father, that we know the rest of the story. We know how to answer that person. Father, I pray. I pray, Father, that every person here would answer the question that Mark, I believe, ended his gospel with. What what are we going to do with with an empty tomb? What are we going to do with angels who say, he's not here, he's risen? What are we going to do with Jesus? I pray each of us before we go today, Father, before we leave this place, would answer that question. It's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Shortest verse in the Bible. And it's in all the manuscripts, all 25,000. Jesus wept. You know that day when John's Gospel records that in the 11th chapter, John's talking about Jesus weeping because he sees Mary and Martha and their grief because they've lost their brother Lazarus. He's died. I believe Jesus is weeping today for the community you and I live in. I believe He's weeping today for families that are hurting, for students that struggle with making right choices. I believe Jesus is weeping today for a church that needs to come alive and meet the needs in this community. In a moment, we're going to stand and sing an invitation hymn. I, I pray that you too, church, I, family of God this morning, I, I pray you too would see Jesus weeping. You know, he, he, he looked at Jerusalem and he said, How often would I have gathered you unto myself? It's like a mother hen gathering her chicks under her wings. How often would I have done that if you just let me? Sometimes I think I, 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 he, sometimes I believe he's saying the same thing to Mount Vernon. How often would I send myself to you in a fresh way? How often would I send myself to you in, in a, way of, a wave of revival if you just let me? Church, dear family, we, we need to pray for this community, the students, for marriages for families and then some of you need to answer the question before you go today what are you going to do with an empty tomb you see that's in all four gospels what are you going to do with the testimony that the tomb is empty what are you going to do with a risen Savior let's stand to our feet